gender identity in populist discourse. Uh, the seminar today is organized by the European Center for Populism Studies for the Future Leader Program of uh, this year. Uh, my name, as anticipated, is Susie Meret. I'm associate professor at the Department of Politics and Society here at Albury University, University, which is in the northern uh, part of the Jutland uh, region in, in Denmark. So. I'm uh, really delighted and uh, really looking forward to, to uh, the uh, speaker today, uh, Dr. Haley McEwen. Uh, Haley is a senior researcher at the WITS uh, Center for Diversity Studies uh, at the University of uh, Witwatersrand, uh, Johannesburg, uh, in South Africa, where she also got her PhD in uh, sociology. Uh, Healy is an expert uh, in the international anti-gender movements and in the uh, pro-family mobilizations uh, against the LGBTIQ plus uh, rights in South Africa and globally. She also studies the connections between so, white supremacy and uh, ethno-nationalism in South Africa and the US, um, also the white genocide. I recollect a lecture for the CAR uh, so blog. Um, uh, she has published uh, so uh, widely uh, in both uh, academic and uh, in popular journals, uh, articles uh, that uh, also have very much relevance uh, to the topic today, which is gender and uh, the radical and populist right, uh, for example, in ethnic and racial studies and development uh, Southern Africa and in uh, open democracy that you can look up. So. Um, the lecture of, uh, um, has a format today that you are already acquainted with, I guess, uh, from uh, yesterday's lecture, but uh, just repeat in order to uh, uh, make you ready for what is coming. Uh, Hilly will uh, so hold a, a, a lecture for uh, uh, about 50 minutes until 4 p.m. Um, and then uh, there will be 30 minutes of breakout rooms uh, that will be uh, in groups where we'll, you will discuss the topic. And uh, these 30 minutes will also allow you to uh, so uh, prepare some of the questions that you want to uh, so ask uh, Healy uh, at, uh, the, um, uh, at the third part of the session uh, where we will reconvene for about uh, 35, uh, 40 minutes. So. We uh, plan to ask group by group. I think that approximately we will have uh, probably four groups uh, today. Uh, so if you just uh, get ready for this, because I mean, it will be about five, six minutes for each group for asking uh, questions. So, and it will be perhaps with one uh, representative of the, uh, of the groups and also with member uh, interventions later on. So um, I think it's a, uh, also, I'm really uh, leaving the floor to uh, Hile and looking very much forward for, for what's to come. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much, Professor Merritt, um, for that warm welcome. And thank you so much to the ECPS organizers for inviting me to come and present as part of the summer school. And um, this is my second year being part of the program. Um, and I'm, yeah, I'm very happy to be back. And it's wonderful to, to meet all of you and, and hear about the research that you're doing. And I just feel so excited to be in this conversation with you. And also just about the fact that there are, you know, up and coming scholars like yourselves who are, you know, dedicating your scholarly work to the study of populism. Um, because as I'm sure we can all agree, this is one of the biggest challenges that we face in our world. And, dealing with the various crises that, you know, we're all, we're all dealing with, um, you know, in different, in different parts of the world. And I mean, I think as, as I hope to um, share with you through my presentation, you know, these issues of, of gender and race are often, you know, a part of these populist narratives, right-wing populist narratives um, in ways that aren't always very perceptible or obvious. Sometimes it's extremely obvious, sometimes it's not so obvious. So I hope to, you know, give you the kind of information and knowledge you're looking for. And I also hope that in doing that, you know, we're able to open up more questions together um, in, this, in this session. And I really look forward to hearing your, your feedback, your questions, your thoughts, your also experiences from your own context um, when we come back after the after the group discussion. So I am going to now share my presentation. 
just bear with me for a moment. Um, and also while I'm doing that, um, I would just like to <clears throat> also say, <clears throat> um, you know, in terms of positioning myself, um, you know, I, I come to this topic from, can you all, is this in the way? Okay. Um, I come to this topic um, as a person who was born in the United States, um, in the Midwest, uh, I grew up in a queer family. I'm also queer identifying myself. Um, and I think <clears throat> also being a young woman growing up in the US, you know, and, and we've all just seen now what's happened with the Rovers Wade reversal. Um, I mean, growing up, I always just felt so oh, like, um, you know, scared of the power of the US Christian right, really to take away my rights of my own bodily autonomy and also the rights of my family. Um, and so this has really become a big part of my work. Um, and I also often say, I mean, you know, that the US Christian right was one of the things that really made me want to leave the United States, right? <laughs> Um, and, and that's, you know, I, I came to South Africa, I pursued my postgraduate studies here, um, and it was only a few years later that after I arrived here in 2005 that um, same-sex marriage was legalized in South Africa, making it <clears throat> the first country in Africa and one of the first countries in the world to, to, to legalize same-sex marriage. And um, it was also at that time that I started to hear the very same, you know, discourses um, about the so-called dangers of same-sex marriage, you know, here in South Africa that I was hearing, you know, growing up in the United States, right? Like same-sex marriage is going to destroy our society and it's, you know, it's un-African, it's immoral, it's against our traditional values, it's against our family values. You know, and it just, it, when I heard this stuff here, it just sent a chill down my spine because, you know, I could hear that, that there was something going on in terms of these narratives being transmitted um, from the US to this context. And um, so I ended up doing my PhD research, exploring this and, and sure enough, I mean, as I will elaborate and I'm not the first researcher who has noted this, but um, the US Christian right has been working to advance its agendas, you know, against reproductive justice, against LGBTI rights, against children's rights um, in several African countries since about the early 2000s. Um, so I did my PhD that I started that in 2013, I finished it in 2018. And it's been after that, that I've also started looking at what's happening globally and trying to understand what's happening, you know, in African contexts in relation to the global, right, anti-gender movement, not only this bilateral dynamic with the US Christian right. Um, <clears throat> so that's kind of where I'm coming from. Um, and also because I, you know, being in the South African context um, and engaging with decolonial theory, being involved in, you know, conversations and research and scholarship uh, where we work with decolonial theory, it, it changed the way that I viewed uh, the U.S. Christian right, um, particularly with regards to the white supremacy that it's advancing, um, even though it, it is gaining many allies who are not white. Um, so that's why this presentation also engages with race. Um, when, when, talk, when I'm talking about, um, you know, the gender ideology, suffer the anti-gender ideology that, you know, has been emerging in, in several African contexts um, for the past two decades at this stage. Um, <clears throat> so, oh gosh. Okay, let me just make sure, sorry. Okay, so as I heard you know, the introductions, some of you definitely seem like you're familiar with you know, the anti-gender movement and you, you know kind of what this term refers to. Um, but to reiterate for you and also to introduce it to people who aren't familiar with the term. Um, first thing to say is, you know, 
these groups that are mobilizing against reproductive justice, LGBTI rights, et cetera, um, they don't call themselves anti-gender, right? They tend to call themselves pro-family and you know, casting themselves in a positive light. And of course, as I'm sure a lot of you would pick up on, <clears throat> you know, in calling themselves pro-family, on the one hand, what they're doing is casting anyone who is critical of them or who believes in, you know, gender, sexuality, and family diversity as being anti-family. And, and this is, of course, a kind of rhetorical tactic that the U.S. Christian right um, has used in calling, you know, people who are pro-choice anti-life and calling themselves pro-life, you know, that that sort of thing. So we can, you know, of course, pick up on that trend and how they call themselves the pro-family movement. And what this movement really has done, and it's done it so effectively, is it's brought together these two main camps, okay, of, of you know, groups that are, well, firstly, people who are against abortion, um, and reproductive justice, and groups who are against same-sex marriage. Now, historically and politically, I mean, they haven't always been aligned. I mean, there have been some people who are anti-abortion, but they support same-sex marriage and LGBTI rights and, and vice versa. Um, but now, this, you ha now we have this big umbrella of the pro-family movement, and it's bringing all of these different groups together. So you have a lot of diverse interests going on um, within this bigger pro-family movement, but at the same time, in calling themselves that, they're really able to coordinate their action and themselves, right? So um, really, I mean, this definition I have here uh, is that this movement is a transnational coalition of anti-progressive conservative activists and organizations who are working to counter sex and gender-based rights um, at country and at global levels. And I think, you know, another key point to take out of this, and I'm sure this is not a news flash, <laughs> is that, you know, this, what we're seeing here is not a backlash, right? It, and, you know, when we think about a backlash, we think like a knee-jerk reaction, something that's, you know, responding to, um, to an event and, you know, and, and almost with this implication, like it'll kind of diffuse or it'll kind of go away um, once this issue calms down or simmers down or is resolved. But, but really what uh, we can see and what, um, I mean, I've found in my own research and other researchers have shown is that this is really a coordinated movement that is not only, you know, working to erode like SRA, like sexual and reproductive health and rights and education, but it's working to put, you know, an alternative forward, a conservative, like far right alternative forward. So they say, right, that so-called gender ideology, which when they say that they mean, you know, gender studies, comprehensive sexuality education, LGBTI rights, reproductive rights, um, and the so-called, what they say, decline of the natural family um, has caused a range of social and economic problems. Um, and of course, when they're talking about the natural family, they're talking about the heterosexual biological married family unit with their biological children. So anyone who isn't part of that category, um, if you were like the child of parents who got a divorce or if you're the child of um, a single parent or you're like me, you grew up with two same-sex parents, um, they call us the victims of the sexual revolution, okay? And they're also trying to rope people into this, um, into their movement by saying, oh, it was so hard for you growing up, you know, as a donor conceived person or as a person of divorced parents and look at how what it's done you know um all the negative outcomes you know in your life and join us you know um so that's also yeah quite scary um, and i think that's one of the key ways they're trying to pull in uh, young people into the movement um so what this 
right? Back to this point of it not being a backlash only, is that, again, they're not only trying to just erode and do away with LGBTI rights and reproductive rights. They're trying to put this idea of the so-called natural family forward as an alternative. Okay, so the way that they describe as an alternative, sorry, um, that they say should be the basis of our, our laws, all of our social norms, our institutions, our social systems, everything. So the way that they define the natural family um, is, quote, the fundamental social unit inscribed in human nature and centered around the voluntary union of a man and a woman in a lifelong covenant of marriage, unquote. So this quote comes from this natural family man manifesto that was written by um, Alan Carlson and Paul Miro. Um, Alan Carlson is actually uh, one of the kind of key figures in the pro-family movement. He started an organization called the World Congress of Families in 1997, um, and they host co global conferences uh, where they bring together pro-family people from all over the world. Um, and, and this is where they do a lot of their networking um, and so forth. And I actually attended one of these uh, World Congress of Families as part of my PhD research. Um, so I can tell you more about that if you're interested. And, and just uh, again, um, in, in promoting this idea that, again, you can see in this definition, you have this man and woman figure, which you know signifies the importance of the gender binary and the fact that there's only two genders, that they should be married, it should be lifelong, again, that's against divorce. Um, and then what they're doing, and if you know, you can notice in this, and, and of course, this is just a very small definition, but they're not using religious, explicitly religious language. I mean, this word covenant does, of course, have a religious connotation. Um, but what they've been actively working to do is to secularize their arguments within, you know, economic language, development language, um, saying that this is our, you know, fundamental social unit, right? And we need this. Um, for our society to function. And increasingly also they actually draw on, you know, social sciences. Um, and there's, you know, you can find there are pro-family aligned social scientists who are producing knowledge um, about the so-called economic and development, um, you know, benefits of heteropatriarchy. <clears throat> um, and, and this is really also enabling this movement to position itself as being aligned actually with human rights framework, sustainable development goals, etc. Um, so I think it's also important um, to, to think about, you know, in understanding where has this movement come from, to think about our wider context. Okay, and there's various factors that I think are as some of the key factors I've put here that I think are some of the most significant contextual factors that have firstly given rise to this anti-gender or pro-family movement, and that have also, you know, really enabled it to, to stick around and, and gain power. So the one is globally, we're seeing a rise in right-wing populist movements. I mean, in relation to lots of different issues. Um, and, and this is, is part of that bigger trend. Uh, we're also seeing more counter movements um, against immigration, against racial justice, against diversity and inclusion, um, and against what I've put here as social justice knowledge, broadly speaking. Um, so there I'm referring to the attacks on critical race theory and the attacks on gender studies, um, which those of you um, I know in Poland, there have been some, um, there was a, a journal, a feminist studies journal, I believe, that was closed down. I know in Hungary, gender studies is banned. Also in Brazil, uh, gender studies has been banned. Um, and, and in 
in critical race, critical race theory um, is just under constant attack, mainly across the, the North Atlantic. <clears throat> Excuse me. So also, um, and it also in relation to just the broader trend about, you know, in, in, of, of rising right wing populism um, is this disillusionment with a global economic system that's happened since the, the recession um, and the increasing economic uncertainty, um, growing inequality and, and precarity. Um, and, and this is something that several scholars have, have said have, has you know, contributed to the rise of, of right-wing populism in the past um, 10, 15 years. Also, um, you know, it's this anti-gender movement. Again, it hasn't just developed out of a vacuum. Um, it hasn't come out of nowhere. And, and many scholars have, have written about um, how this movement in many ways has been a response to the Western international gay rights movement, <clears throat> um, which has really fed into this idea that homosexuality is a form of Western cultural imperialism. Um, and, and, and there, I mean, this is also, I mean, the term gender, the way that the idea of gender gets used, um, as, as was discussed in the, the readings that, um, you know, that we, I gave you for today, uh, is, you know, how this idea of gender gets used like a symbolic glue, right, to hold together all these different ideas. So, I mean, of course, um, gay rights is a big part of that. Feminism is also a big, a big part of that. And so, so really, I mean, this, like, you know, we've had all these pronouncements by um, Western leaders, by, you know, the International Monetary Fund, fund um, saying, you know, that, that countries must, you know, global South countries and, and Eastern Europe, European countries must acknowledge and accept and have LGBTI rights. Otherwise they're gonna lose international aid. There's gonna be other penalties, um, things like that. Um, so, I mean, that's one, one dimension of it. I mean, and of course that is, has really just, you know, made several leaders in many parts of the world just dig their heels in more and say, look, you see, this is the West trying to impose their, their values on us um, and, um, and other things as well, which I'll get to later. <clears throat> so there, so some of the scholars who have written about this are like Jazz Beer Pua, who has written about ideas of homo nationalism and, and pinkwashing, um, and, and Raul Rao, who's written about global homo capitalism. And these different terms, right, refer to the various ways in which, you know, LGBTI rights are becoming normalized in particular ways, especially in relation to geopolitics and setting up new binaries, right, where gay rights gets used as a, like a yardstick to measure which societies are civilized and which are not civilized or which are developed and which are underdeveloped, right? It's becoming like a new kind of civilizational discourse that reproduces a lot of these old colonial um, discourses and, and power relations, right? Uh, that are at the basis of, of the, you know, these concepts. Um, and also, you know, as part of that, I mean, also just generally, I mean, growing demands for equal recognition and rights from queer, transgender, intersex communities, you know, within national and global political debate. So, I mean, regardless of the kind of, um, we can criticize, right, the like Western gay rights, you know, bigger agenda. Uh, but then, I mean, in local context, national context, you have movements, um, for better, you know, for recognition and rights that are also prompting this kind of response. So just quickly, um, some of the advocacy strategies I just wanted to tell you about, um, you know, in terms of what pro-family groups are doing, they don't just have one, you know, one, one strategy, <laughs> they have several, right? And they're extremely well-funded. Um, so they spend a lot of, 
time uh, and investing in, in media and their strategic marketing and communications. They are constantly developing, developing their international networks, um, you know, at country levels and at the UN. They are mentoring and supporting, you know, well, a lot of the pro-family groups based in the US are, are mentoring and supporting pro-family organizations in other parts of the world. They are campaigning online and offline. They convene online and offline events and gatherings, webinars, for example, or like these World Congress of Families events. They're actively growing the next generation of activists, right? So we are sorely mistaken if we believe that this is just a bunch of old fuddy duds, right? With old antiquated ideas that are just going to evaporate when these people die, right? That's not gonna happen, um, unfortunately. Uh, they are actively, you know, pulling young people into the movement. And I can tell you at the World Congress of Families that I attended, they actually um, had given bursaries to about 200 young, you know, emerging, uh, pro emerging leaders, right? Uh, Pro-family leaders. And many of these kids or some of these kids were children of the, you know, some of the older activists in the pro-family movement, but I think it was broader than that as well. They had their own entire program, um, everything, you know, and, and they were brought from all over the country to attend this World Congress of Families. Um, they're monitoring and intervening, right, in policy that is aiming at, you know, creating more, you know, inclusive frameworks for, you know, reproductive rights. I've got CSE, which is Comprehensive Sexuality Education, for gender and sexuality, diversity, inclusion, right? Um, they're actively monitoring, you know, resolutions, for example, that are coming up for debate at the UN. Um, they're, they're monitoring what NGOs are doing and they're, they're intervening, they're developing uh, strategies of response. So they're very much, um, you know, positioning and, and, and really trying to get ahead of the curve, which makes them very effective. They are doing a lot of strategic litigation around LGBTI rights um, and policies. So what I mean by that is like, you know, the, the, the baker who doesn't want to bake the cake for a same-sex couple, pro-family groups like Alliance Defending Freedom, for instance, uh, which is in the United States, but also operating globally, um, will then support the baker, right, in a, in a lawsuit. Um, so to, to, and that, in, in attempting to really get a precedent set that businesses do, do not have to serve people or, or do things that violate their, their religious beliefs, right? And they've been successful in doing this. Um, and uh, as I already mentioned, they are producing knowledge that supports their claims. They've got various think tanks all over the place. Um, here's a couple of just examples, right, from different global, you know, contexts. Um, that, you know, illustrate kind of what, you know, I don't know if you guys can see this bar here, so apologies if you can. Um, this top left image was this um, so-called free speech bus campaign, which was an initiative of an organization called Citizen Go that is based in Spain, as well as um, the National Organization for Marriage, which is in the United States. They did this free speech bus campaign they did it in countries, they did it in Madrid, they did it in the US, in France, um, and then there's another place that's eclipsing my mind at the moment. Uh, apologies for that, but um, so that's one example. You can see just the kind of rhetoric they're using here. Um, the top right image uh, was from a protest against Judith Butler that happened in Brazil in 2017 where she, Judith Butler was there to, she was, they were co-convening a conference on kind of threats to democracy actually um, in Sao Paulo. And several anti-gender protesters came out to protest Judith Butler. They even burned an effigy um, of Judith Butler in the streets and 
yeah, um, it was quite a high profile story. On the bottom left and, and right are two different protests. You know, again, I mean, one, the left is in Poland, the one on the right is, is in Colombia. Uh, and you can really see it's such similar, even imagery um, and rhetoric that is being used. Okay. Um, all right. So, of course, um, we're seeing, as much as we're seeing this all over the world, you know, we would be remiss uh, if we didn't give credit <laughs> to the, the extent to which the US Christian right has been, you know, feeding these and fueling this, the, this global movement um, in terms of resources, in terms of the discourses, in terms of the knowledge production. There's a lot of, you know, anti-gender material coming from the United States. Um, so I just have a couple of images here. I mean, right, we have like these marches for the family, um and uh obviously all of our anti-abortion um you know activists and i just wanted to quickly find i've got a note here i wanted to share okay so um on the bottom right um this i don't know if anyone here saw this i'm sure some of you did was the statement by supreme court justice clarence thomas following the reversal of roe v wade where he calls he says that you know um following that reversal he's saying now we should consider all of the you know we should re reconsider all of the court's substantive due process precedents um especially those that have happened in recent years um so he mentions griswold lawrence and obergefell so griswold um was a precedent that was set in 1965 actually and it was um it protected the, the right of married couples to purchase and use contraception. So he's saying that should be challenged. Uh, Lawrence uh, refers to Lawrence versus Texas, which was in 2003. And that precedent made the criminalization of sodomy unconstitutional. Okay, so made unconstitutional. Um, in 2003, and Obergefell is our most recent one, which was, um, you know, the fundamental right to for same-sex couples to be able to marry. So we can see now how also it, it helps us to see right how these issues are all linked within this pro-family anti-gender rhetoric, right? Where they're they're really going for the whole package, right? Um, bodily autonomy, sexual orientation, reproductive justice. Um, you know, all of all of that, and it's extremely scary. And, you know, I think one of the things that really scared me, as I said, you know, when I came to South Africa and I heard, you know, this rhetoric here um, was knowing just how powerful this movement is. And I mean, it is so underestimated. And I would dare say that is their greatest strength is the extent to which they have been completely underestimated. Um, especially, you know, as a scholar, you know, within academic spaces, you know, where, I mean, when I started doing this research in 2013, often, you know, when I would tell people that I was doing my research on, you know, on the US Christian right, they were like, yuck, like, why? Why would you, why would you want to do research on, on these like fringe lunatic uh, groups that really don't have any political power, right? But now, of course, we can see with the election of Donald Trump, this Supreme Court ruling, I mean, so many things and, and seeing their influence globally, I mean, we can definitely put that idea to bed that um, they have no political power and are just a bunch of fringe people who are just, you know, crazy, right? Which is largely the way that like the leftist kind of academic spaces have, have viewed them. And I, I also hear out on the left, which I think just captures so well, you know, the, um, the point that you know of gender and race, which I'll get to in a moment, being uh, intersectional in right wing, you know, anti gender politics was this supposed it was a slip, she said. Um, but this representative Mary Miller 
who following the Supreme Court decision said that on behalf of the MAGA patriots, she wanted to thank Trump for the historic victory for white life in the Supreme Court. Now, she later said she's meant to say right to life, but I don't really think they're very similar to slip and so badly. <laughs> um, so in African context, right, um, and, and this is kind of the slice I'm, of course, emphasizing in, in this presentation, but, you know, we've seen a lot of this same stuff, as I've mentioned, uh, this kind of U.S. Christian rights style rhetoric. So on the upper left-hand corner, that was an image from a march that happened in Nairobi in 2015. It was called the Protect the Family March, which we've had, you know, similar demonstrations in the United States against same-sex marriage. In the upper right-hand corner uh, is a protest against comprehensive sexuality education that was in, in Namibia in, in 2019. Now, this, this movement um, against stopping comprehensive sexuality education is something that's been going on across East and Southern Africa for the past few years. And really what they're opposing is the inclusion of gender and sexuality diversity, as well as safe sex education in school curricula and of course these groups are promoting what they call you know abstinence only um, as the only kind of education that children should receive in school about sex um, and of course the abstinence only approach has been shown to be ineffective uh, not only unrealistic in relation to the contextual realities that young people find themselves in and recently, um, we've had in, here in South Africa, um, there's a fairly well-known pop singer named Steve Hofmeyer, who um, has kind of joined the anti-gender attacks on Disney. Um, so I don't know if some of you are familiar, but Disney recently has said that they are going to have more inclusive you know, characters. They're gonna have queer um, characters in their, films and there's been a huge, you know, I will say here backlash, but you know, counter, you know, anti-gender opposition to to this in the United States. Um, and, and this just shows how it's traveled here to South Africa, right? We don't even have Disney theme parks here or anything either. Um, but of course, Disney is a global, of course, um, obsession. Um, but he said, you know, there's a quote from him there where he says, unlike the LGBTQI plus community, I did not keep silent when Disney decided to sexualize our toddlers by sexualizing their movie characters, right? Um, so, and there you can see other things that he says where he, he basically um, associated homosexuality with um, bestiality and pedophilia. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, you can see, you can, See there how it's traveling and also I mean you can see from these images right it's not only like white people living in Africa it's not only black people living in Africa right who are taking up this um, anti-gender pro-family right cause um, it actually could say it's quite a diverse movement this year just shows um, well, an estimate, it's, it's not an estimate, but I think it, you can, we can say it's at least $280 million being spent by the US Christian right globally um, to advance their agendas. This is research that was conducted by the Open, De by Open Democracy. Um, it's extremely useful. It's kind of one of a kind report that came out in 2020. Um, it's been, it, you know, one of the things as a researcher that it's extremely hard to do is to actually trace the money to find out how are these different groups being funded. Let me just check the time. Oh, dear. Okay. So here we go. Why are these groups um, promoting pro-family policies in African countries? Here's just a few examples um, that we can see um, of some of their activities locally. So basically, uh, to just try and keep this short, I draw on these four paradigms primarily when I'm doing my work on this movement, um, understanding firstly why some differences make a difference in our lives more than others and realizing that, you know, and thinking about diversity from a social constructionist perspective, not of course seeing difference as um, 
something innate or biological or fixed or essential, but rather something that is really mediated by power in our society. Right? And diversity, of course, referring it's it's you know um, approaching it from from that perspective. Um, also drawing on critical discourse analysis, um, you know, as a critical social scholar and looking at how language and, and pro-family language is, is being used to normalize um, and to constitute, uh, you know, the idea that the gender binary and hierarchy are, you know, natural, they're the, you know, biological, um, and, and there's, there's nothing we can do, you know, to change that. Um, and I draw a lot on decolonial and anti-imperialist queer and feminist theory that have really shown the, the ways in which the gender binary was used as a mechanism of colonial conquest, right? And it was used uh, to construct ideas of which, I, which societies were civilized, so-called, and which were uncivilized, um, which I will tell you more about in the next slide. And finally, intersectionality theory, right? And understanding that, you know, the constructions of race, class, uh, sex, and these hierarchies, um, you know, they're, they, they're all intermeshed, right? In terms of how our systems of oppression operate. So in terms of what the decolonial and anti-imperialist feminist and queer scholars have shown, uh, which has been really central to how I've interpreted pro-family um, discourse and ideology is looking at how, you know, as Sally Kitsch here says, um, sexual difference and the gender binary became the basic tenets of the ideology of racial hierarchy and white supremacy during processes of nation formation in the West. And there's an example down there, this quote, um, Kind of demonstrating that and how this idea of gender and race was so so intermeshed within colonial ideology and and europe europe and north american constructions of you know that part of the world as being superior to the to the rest of the world so within this these processes right um and within colonial knowledge production that was used to justify colonial conquest and domination and enslavement of, of African and other, other indigenous people was this idea that the gender binary and hierarchy were right the evidence of an enlightened society. And you know, in African contexts, for example, where people were not living gender the way that Europeans and mostly Christians were, were living and doing and knowing gender, um, this became used as a way to, to um, categorize African people as uncivilized and to justify the colonial intervention, right? And, and justify like missionary education. So you can see here missionary schooling. Um, you can see here an example, I mean, of how children were put through this process. Um, you know, this was an uh, example of North America, but where indigenous children were put into colonial you know, missionary schools and essentially stripped of all of their, um, or they tried to really strip them of their, their indigenous you know, knowledge systems, spiritual practices, all of that. Um, so this really just reiterates um, what I said before, um, but at a global scale, right? If we think about it, how this idea of the gender binary, right? Which is institutionalized within the, nuclear family structure, right, which holds it all together. There are also some really brilliant, um, you know, queer and feminist scholars, for example, Anne Laura Stoller, who have shown how this idea of the, the family, the nuclear family, um, was used to also not only hold in place, you know, domestic power relations between like men, women, and children, but also how it ordered the whole global right power order into this or through this this metaphor or it was an organizing trope like stoller says um for marshalling all of these diverse cultures around the world into a single global narrative right that was ordered and managed 
by Europeans, of course, who, who are the ones who invented, <laughs> right, the, um, the concept of, of the nuclear family. Here's a couple of organizations um, that have been quite influential in advancing pro-family politics at a global scale within like U the UN, for example. Um, and I'm just gonna skip over that since we're running out of time. This is an example of, uh, this was actually last year where it, um, uh, it, there was a US Christian right organization uh, it's a, quite a key one, um, Family Watch International. They alerted several of their partner organizations who are also around the world um, about this World Health Assembly resolution that was um, addressing the prevention of violence against women and children. Uh, this resolution was meant to, they, there was a proposal to include uh, comprehensive sexuality education in this um, in the resolution as one of the steps that is needed to, you know, uh, prevent violence against women and children. And they mobilized against it. They, and they actually ended up having it removed um, from the resolution. And I'm just trying to find my cursor, which I can't find. Um, but basically at the bottom here, in case you can't see it, if this bar is over the text, but they thank um, Eswatini, which is formerly Swaziland, it's in Southern Africa, and the Russian Federation, right, for being strong leadership on this. And I think that just shows the new geopolitical alliances that are also forming through this, right? And the fact, as I mentioned early on, that, I mean, this is a global movement, right? It's not just, right, only the US Christian, right, driving this stuff. Um, while they might be driving it, it's also a huge force, you know, and, and influential um, kind of grouping in this. But, you know, you can see here that, you know, it's not just creating now more linkages between African countries and the US. I mean, here we've got this kind of alliance and alignment happening between an uh, African country and, and Russia. So, I mean, and, and Russia's also um, been a big kind of, I suppose, how can you say, like force or uh, key role player as a country um, within the, the pro-family movement. And I'm sure as some of you from Eastern European countries might be aware, there are now several so-called pro-family policies um, across the region. And many of these, I mean, to speak to the issue of um, just quickly uh, ethno-nationalism is that, and I, is that, you know, these groups are often, they often will argue, especially in contexts where there are declining birth rates, that the declining birth rates are, have been caused by queer and feminist social movements, right, that are like discouraging people from having children or making them not want to have as many children. They're, so they're blaming these social movements, right, for declining birth rates um, and, and putting these pro-family policies in place to encourage citizens to have more children, right? And a huge part of that, right, isn't just, oh, we need to get our birth rates up, right? Why do we need to get our birth rates up, right? It's about the economy. Um, it's about, which I mean, it's a legitimate concern, right? But uh, where the issue comes in is that this motivation for encouraging citizens to have children is also about keeping foreigners out and not needing to become reliant on immigrant labor, right, in order to keep the economy going, um, which is what will happen, right, if, if these countries don't, like, reproduce their, their populations, right, to have people born to take over the jobs of people who are dying and retiring, right? So, um, so I mean, that's where you start to really also see the, the link with white supremacy and, and ethno-nationalism. Um, within this this rhetoric, because it's often not explicitly on the surface. So also, you know, what these groups are doing, I mean, in addition to all the kinds of um, ethno-nationalist, white supremacist agendas um, that they are advancing, is they are er trying to eradicate and erase alternatives 
Um, so, you know, erasing queer people, their families, their realities, trying to invalidate the, uh, the right of, you know, gender diverse people and queer people to even exist. Um, you know, when they say things like there's only two genders, right? There's, that's it. I mean, that is what they are ultimately doing, right? Um, which also really shows the kind of genocidal dimension and violent dimension of their rhetoric, which they often disguise, right? And they, they, they couch it in these very benign and respectable or decent language about caring for families, uh, etc., caring for mothers and children, and that child protection is discourse. But once you, of course, start unpeeling the layers, you can really start to see how all of that rhetoric, what it's doing is it's concealing extremely violent agendas. And I mean, since, I mean, in this context here in South Africa, this, these groups have definitely uh, become more prolific and, and vocal over the past 10 or so years. Uh, and we've also seen an increase in violence and hate crimes and killings of queer people. Um, I'm not going to say it's like directly, you know, the, it's correlated like that or causal like that. But I mean, it, it, they're creating a climate, right, in which violence and the physical erasure of queer people is legitimate, right, and permissible and actually seen as something that is good, right, for the nation. So to conclude, and I apologize for going over time. Um, so we can see transnational pro-family uh, anti-gender politics. Um, they're not only about enforcing heteropatriarchy, um, they're about you know, reinforcing white supremacy, uh, the hegemony of you know, Euro-America. Um, and, and these Euro-American ways of knowing and doing, right, gender and sexuality and family. Uh, and, and they're using these as terms, right, that are um, like universal, right? They're trying to say that, you know, the, the so-called natural family is a universal truth across all time and space, right? <laughs> so, um, and that of course are, they're, they're Anglo-centric terms and definitions um, that they are trying to say, you know, apply all over the world. Whereas, of course, we know, you know, you can look at lots of archival research showing the kinds of gender, sexuality, and kinship diversity that have existed and which continue to exist in societies all over the world, right? Um, and also, you know, looking at this colonial history, which I couldn't get too in depth about, um, but we can maybe chat about it more in the discussion if you like. But it's how this actual idea of the nuclear family has been so complicit within, you know, the history of colonial conquest. And, and we can see through the contemporary pro family movements activities um, that this is being like reinvigorated as a, a, a way of you know, normalizing and naturalizing forms of inequality, right? Um, saying that, you know, it's natural that men are breadwinners and women stay at home and children are there, the property of the parents and, um, you know, really reinforcing this, but then also, you know, reinforcing ideas about like, geopolitics and and which nations are and creating new ideas of like which nations are superior to others i mean i know um in a, many post-soviet states there's a a sense of, like poland um i've read about um how you know this idea that and also in russia that that these countries have preserved them their their nations from the influences of feminism right and that they actually have like superior um, and, and, and tr their, their traditional family values have remained intact because of the way the West has been kept out. But anyway, so I mean, we can see how that's kind of changing, but historically um, we can use, you know, we can use history as a guide to see that this idea of the, the nuclear family gets used to constitute 
global power relations, right, in, in particular ways. Um, we can also see, again, not being about heter heteropatriarchy alone, but also the ethno-nationalism dimension. Um, and these heterosexist and heteropatriarchal constructions of citizenship and the nation, right? Like in, in African countries, there's this whole you know, idea that homosexuality is un-African and that we need to you know, preserve heterosexuality as what is authentically African in order to protect national sovereignty, actually, right? It goes up to that level, escalates, right? Um, to the level of national sovereignty saying, you know, as Africans, we are authentically, like, essentially heterosexual and any kind of gender sexuality diversity is an infringement on our national sovereignty, our traditions, uh, our cultures, which of course, again, Archival research paints a very different picture, showing the fact that gender and sexuality diversity have always been a part of African societies. And also what this movement is doing, I mean, if you look at what it, you know, like many of these right-wing populist movements, um, what they're ultimately trying to do is to render certain forms of inequality as natural, right? These ideas of difference being uh, like, that men and women are different and this is just natural. And, you know, because the difference is natural, the inequality is also natural, right? And really eroding and, and putting a wedge, right, into this paradigm of equal rights, of social justice and, and human rights. Because once they can pull that out and say, look, gender is real um, and the hierarchy is real, they can then use that to naturalize many other kinds of injustices, right? Like indigenous people's rights, for example. And, um, you know, they're also um, constellating this network of conservative civil society organizations that are, you know, around the world and can really be activated in relation to all different kinds of issues. Um, actually, and I, and I think, I mean, in terms of, you know, when I'm doing my research, I often think, you know, now they're focusing on gender and family, but I mean, maybe in 20 years time, the conversation will have shifted to, you know, children's rights, for example, um, it, to a, a greater extent, or, um, you know, to other, to other issues. Um, and how this you know, they are really creating an infrastructure, right, through their activism that, you know, hypothetically, if they were to get their way and reinforce a gender binary everywhere and criminalize homosexuality everywhere, you know, and transgender rights, it's not like they would just go away, right? They would, they would move on to something else. Um, so that is where I will leave it. Um, here are some of my references. And I really look forward to hearing your, um, your comments, your reflections um, that, that come out of your.